Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, so good to, to have you all uh, here for this so important discussion, uh, which is uh, coming at a time when I'll say the world is trouble. Um, we are so privileged to have this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are, uh, very excellent uh, people who are going to uh, bring light to some of the urgent challenges that uh, not only Cameroon uh, is facing uh, today. I want to briefly introduce uh, to you uh, some of the, the panelists, but I think there is going to be a welcome word, uh, an introduction to, to, the, to the event and uh, um, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the institution that is gathering us this, uh, this afternoon. Um, so I, I, just, I just want to say uh, quickly, uh, briefly, uh, first, thank you to the uh, International Crisis Group who is gathering us uh, this afternoon, and especially uh, to Elvis Ari, who is, uh, uh, well, somehow, uh, well, at the, at the front line uh, for this uh, discussion. Uh, permit me to also greet here and uh, with a lot, a lot of gratitude, Sarah Deva Lifanda, who is uh, the, the founder and the CAO of, of Hope of Africa, uh, the general coordinator for the Southwest and the Northwest Women's Task Force. Uh, Sarah, hello. Um, of course, uh, yeah, uh, Maggie Kilo. Who is the uh, international development specialist, uh, educator, and state fragility expert? Who, as the vice chair of Southern Cameroon's Alliance, uh, is going to be here with us? Hello, Maggie. Um, Rosaline Oba, uh, who is the national coordinator of uh, Cameroon Community Media Network, the CMN, trainer in peace. Hello, Rosalind. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to I want to say that our discussion is going to be uh, organized uh, around uh, intervention by all the panelists, and then we'll have uh, a a a, Q, uh, a, Q, uh, a, Q, uh, a session. And uh, I really uh, I really want to to say that uh, this uh, conversation is coming at a time when. We need to hear and listen to strong women and women who are active, who are on the field there and, and who have something to say about how to challenge uh, this, uh, this terrible situation that uh, the, the, the Cameroon is, is facing. I want to really emphasize on the, on the fact that this is happening in a time when uh, we are almost all uh, convinced that uh, we are living a tragedy uh, just yesterday, we had something that happened in Kondo Titi, and I've been very, uh, I was very uh, humbled to hear even voices that are so uh, quick to, 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 to condemn or to, 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 well, some of the positions that we, can, we, we, we have been denouncing. But I, I, I hear everybody here and there clearly saying that this is time, uh, something is strongly, uh, strongly done. I also want to say clearly that, uh, well, uh, in this uh, discussion, it is both your experience, but also your analysis, which is required. There are things that we need to understand, and I really count on you, uh, my dear sisters, to really bring uh, to light uh, what we are not seeing, what is the unknown unknown, uh, so that we can go forward and, and really tackle this situation. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to maybe uh, just open the, as I'm introducing the, uh, well, the speakers, I want to just maybe let um, uh, Elvis say a word eventually uh, as the, uh, well, the voice of international crisis group in this conversation, maybe Elvis, do you want to say before I just, I just open the, the discussion with the interventions of our, our speakers.
Thank you very much, Nadine, for that in introduction. Um, um, thank you, uh, viewers and listeners, uh, for coming on to this uh, webinar. Uh, we are very privileged to have uh, all of you here uh, from every corner of the world, especially from Cameroon. Uh, some of you are right there in the very difficult uh, regions in the Anglophone areas. Um, I'll just uh, talk briefly about uh, this report uh, so that we can get on uh, the, the discussions. Uh, we conducted this uh, research uh, from around August 2020 to January uh, 2022. So it's been in the long time in, in the making. Uh, and we spoke to over 100 uh, people, uh, 100, uh, over 100, about 120 very detailed uh, interviews. But in addition to that, uh, we had uh, very many other interactions with uh, some of these women, some of the key protagonists. Uh, we spoke to people in government, we spoke to uh, women, we spoke to separatists, uh, we spoke to victims, to ordinary people. Uh, we spoke to Anglophones, we spoke to Francophones, we spoke to the international community, uh, both in Yaoundé and back in their capitals, to be able to get a good understanding of what's uh, happening. So this report is specifically focused on women uh, in the conflict in the Anglophone uh, uh, crisis. Um, what, what I'd like to say struck me particularly uh, during this research and in terms of what has come out uh, in this report is uh, we were, uh, some people, many people were familiar, uh, we can say, with uh, a lot of the activism of some of the women's groups uh, in asking for, for peace in the Anglophone regions, in pressuring the government, uh, in pressuring the separatists, in calling on the international community to pay attention on the sufferings that Cameroonians, especially Anglophone Cameroonians, are going through in, in, this, in this conflict. Now, but that's generally uh, the view um, and you know, in Cameroon being a very patriarchal uh, society, uh, the tend people tended to view uh, women as only limited to making calls for peace and return to normalcy. But actually, as we found that uh, during our research, women play a much more uh, vibrant and broader role uh, than meets the eye. So you have women who are rebels. Uh, you have women who are campaigners uh, for peace, as we've discussed. Uh, you have women who hold very strong political opinions on what uh, the solution to the conflict and to the crisis should be. So we have a diversity of view from uh, the women who are involved in this uh, uh, conflict. And we also saw very many motivations for women getting involved in this conflict, Some of which, many of which you'll be able to see when you look at our report. Uh, so I, I can leave it there now, and maybe we give the floor to the other members of, of the panel uh, to start addressing some of the questions we wanted to look at in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Uh, thank you for this introduction. I really want to, to, to encourage everybody to, 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 to read that report. I think it was a, a wonderful insight on how women are both breakers of peace and maker of, of peace. And it's very important to be able to, to have this, these two dimensions of uh, what is going on here in the, in the Anglophone Cameroon and what are these women doing? And it's so, uh, well, it's so important to, to hear their voices. And uh, I want to, to maybe start this conversation up around all the experience. It's, 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 an, it's an experience section and, and here uh, will be, will be um, uh, so happy to hear about uh, what as women involved in, within, around uh, all these issues. Uh, well, how have you been able to stand, to act, to react? Uh, and I want to start this maybe uh, with you, Sarah, Sarah Deval. Uh, please, I would like to, I'd like to, to like to, to hear uh, about well, how you, as uh, somebody who lives in the uh, in the crisis area and who is familiar with what it is on a daily basis to, to be living uh, uh, in in this in this uh, in in this area, uh, and how have you been able to campaign for peace? We'd like to have your experience on this. So please tell us uh, how do women. Uh, who experience this conflict in their different ways as, as people living in the in the conflict uh, region like 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 yours. So 
Can you can you tell us more both your own experience and how the women you 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 work you work for uh, how how have have they been able to 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 face all this, Sarah? Uh, well, good afternoon again. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, yes, it is not uh, an easy one. Uh, living in a crisis zone, and as a woman, it is a painful experience where you see every day you get up in the morning, you see uh, a dead body, or you hear of gunshots and the aftermath of the gunshots. And as, as a mother, firstly, no mother would want to, to lose a child. And irrespective of uh, your, your ideologies, and your differences, nobody wants another one dead. And it's it's painful, it's, it, it hurts, you know, seeing how lives are being wasted. So it's it's a terrible experience that I wouldn't want any other person to, to go through this, to go through what the women in both the Northwest and Southwest are going through at this moment. And uh, as of what we have done, as women, when the crisis started, we could no longer take the, the dot, death toll that was increasing day in, day out. The women came up with the idea that in as much as we are crying in, in dispersed ranks, our voices cannot be heard. So we came up uh, and the, the vision bearer, that I'll call her Madam Extra Umam, brought up the idea that it is good that women come together so that the voices will be louder and heard. That is how SNOT came up. We came out, the first, our first outing was to go to Ekona or Munya when the crisis was real hot, where we had to do some uh, humanitarian uh, outreach. For, uh, for people that had left Ekona and the other areas that were badly hit at that time. We did that and uh, coming back, we discovered that it is not ending. It, it aggravates day in, day out. The conflict escalates. And uh, we started with a lamentation campaign that we did both in both regions, the Southwest and Northwest respectively where women came out and said enough is enough. We don't want the dead, we are tired, we want peace, we want dialogue. Well, it seems as if at that time, our outings fell on dead ears. We did the second one when the prime minister had his maiden visit to both Northwest and Southwest. The women came out and ambushed him. And, and he like, okay, fine, we will give you people a dialogue. Yes, we went to, after that, we were invited for the pre-consultative talks where we unanimously came together and brought out ideas how we think the dialogue should be carried out. And we gave the government four points. The way we think this whole process should go. Well, we will say that they gave the dialogue, but, it wasn't that inclusive as we had uh, outlined. In the dialogue, we went there, we tried to disperse ourselves in different commissions, even though uh, not officially invited, we actually invited ourselves to those commissions and we took active parts. And we ensured that the voices of the voiceless are heard. We have done a lot. We actually told the government, the issue is not uh, the marginalization. Those are all effects. We were asking them to look at the root cause. What is it that cannot be solved? Let's look at it. Let's come together and look at it. They created the DDR 
the women also studied the DDR. And we went and met the officials of the DDR and we pointed out some lapses of the DDR. And we offered our services of which mm, we were never contacted. We also have had seminars, trainings to train the women. You know, it is not easy. Women are always the first respondents when situations like this arise. And we had to train them because most of them also had gone through a lot of psychological trauma. And we need to train them on uh, the first, give them a psychological first aid. We also had to train them on identifying people or youth that can easily be radicalized. So, and how to bring them back to, so to, to, to talk and praise them and to try to bring them out of the state of depression that they uh, had find themselves as women. I bet you women living in both the Northwest and the Southwest region. It is a hard thing. My personal experience, I lost two of my uncles just because they were um, retired military men. Our brothers got to them and asked them for in, uh, their, their, their arms, or whereas they didn't have any, because when you go on retirement, you dispose of them, you hand it back over. And they took the first one, and they brought him back in without a head. It was hard because for me, the family was like, where is the peace builder? I felt bad because you are, it is, you are fighting, you want peace and you are the one that is being hurt, that is hurt. And the second incident came up again where the other one was, was taken and he was brought in pieces. That day that the first one was killed, accidentally, two boys, innocent boys were shot just because they found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they were looked as uh, one of the people that took him, that kidnapped him. Whereas they were, it was on a, a ghost town day, on a ghost town on a Monday. Whereas they were going to do their own thing but they were caught up in that mess. Now, imagine that is you, three persons have just gone innocently and probably they were all ignorant of the actual effects, actual uh, prizes. They just find themselves in this. And it is painful because if every woman living in the Northwest and Southwest have to tell you their story, I don't think we will, the next day, this crisis will have to continue. But the issue is those concerned have given a death ear to the women, have given a death ear to what is happening. They have decided not to see what is happening to the people. Sarah, we will surely, I think we'll surely come back to, to this issue. I, I, I will have to, to, to also see because what you are saying and you are, do, you are saying quite clearly is that um, you've been very active. You as uh, other women, you mentioned uh, Esther Umam and others have been very active in bringing public attention on, on this, on this uh, conflict as a gender, also gen with gender-based violence. And you've, been, you've demonstrated to, to call the public attention on on, on this, you, you've mentioned the, your, your, your participation or how you step in the national dialogue. Uh, you, you've also underlined the fact that some of the contribution that women made in this issue was, were down looked at. So we'll come back to that uh, if, if, you, if you don't mind. I want to uh, ask uh, Maggie, Maggie, uh, because here we see that, okay, uh, uh, Sarah Lifanda as somebody who is, who is living uh, there, as we say here in ground zero, um, and who is facing in, on a daily basis what, what it means to, to be confronted to, to, to the horror and the, the tragedy of, of this conflict. So you, uh, uh, yeah, Maggie, as an Anglophone Cameroonian who lives in, uh, in, the, in the US uh, and 
who lived there and who is now uh, well involved in the in the um, uh, who is having an, an international uh, career. I want to know, as uh, a woman of the diaspora, well, what is the motivation that you have to 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 to, to step in to 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 get to get involved, uh, and more generally, what motivates women in the diaspora to 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 engage. Uh, and, and what, what is your relationship to, to women who are based out there in the, in, in the Norway and in the South and more generally in the, in the, conflict, uh, in the conflict zone? So please, uh, Maggie, tell us. And, and thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nadine. I, uh, thanks so much yes. for being here. Yes, I am very happy to be here with you. Um, before the war, uh, women in the diaspora have always been involved with matters at home. Because when you leave home, you leave your family behind and you're living outside in the Western Hemisphere, you're living in the West. You, you go to school, you work, you raise your children, but you always send remittances back home. And the remittances that uh, the people in the diaspora, and especially women, because women do contribute a lot. They are working here as nurses. They are working in all kinds of jobs. And the amount of remittances that they sent back home before the war was around a billion dollars a year. Total, about you know a million of Southern Cameroonians who live abroad send that much money back home. We know our environment, our homeland, has been very much marginalized by the rest of the country. So we, are, we don't have the kinds of institutions that employ people. You see, you go to a big towns, you find degree holders as taxi drivers and Ben Shikinas, you know. So the, the, that part of the country is very much dependent on remittances from the diaspora. Now, on top of all the work that women are doing out here in the diaspora, going to school, working, taking care of their kids, taking care of their husbands and households, you know, and having to take care normally of their families back home, you add the war that has come now to really add an increased burden on them. And so you find the women you know, now, especially in the humanitarian areas, making sure that they can feed the IDPs, they send money back, contribute money for food. You know, we talk about your, wrap your charity in dignity, you know, the women's sanitation, you know, women are in places where, you know, they, they are suffering, they're really suffering. So the burden on the diaspora and the women in the diaspora especially is much more than normal, but you can imagine that um, you know they have to train the women in activities that are income generating for themselves. You know, make sure that they are well fed, take care of their health, and some of the health problems that come from the guns as well. You find women whose intestines have been you know out of their bodies because of gunshots, their eyes pulled, gorged out, and all kinds of really, really uh, horrible things that have happened to them, the rape victims, but most of all is the war trauma. The war trauma that actually causes a lot of the mental uh, cases that we see. So the depression and all of that. And we know that, you know, look at a country where the teachers are not even paid today, normally for doing their work normally, who is going to take care of our war trauma? Who's going to take care of our people if this war even ends? And that's why we're saying we really need our own homeland so we can take care of our people and we can do the things for ourselves that we should be doing. I am a child of the, the 60s and the 50s, and I saw what my country looked like. By the time I came back from studies to work in Yaoundé, to work in Cameroon, I couldn't believe that the country had degenerated so much. We used to have, you know, how homes and streets named and numbered you come now to the country you just find dirt everywhere you know cholera is now something that people have to live with so you know we look at the situation here it's appalling and 
we see that the government priorities are different. They are not even priorities of the people. And so we really have to do something to take care of our people. And especially with this war, which is so unnecessary. If you imagine that this war began because parents want better teachers in the schools, not teachers who don't speak the language of their children. And then lawyers want the common law. We as Anglophones, we are used to um, expression, you know, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. These two things that we're, we're being deprived of in, and these are the, the, the root causes of the war. You know, we are able to take care of the marginalization, but to be able to speak freely, to be a journalist and know that you say one word and you'll be taken and, taken and locked up. You know, to be a teacher and know that, you know, you cannot get your pay, you cannot teach, you know, in the language that you, you've studied, you know, you have children who are being, they're going to school, but they don't have the education, the quality education that we parents cry for. So it is that that we are looking to change. So we want peace so that our children can go back to school. We want peace so that our country, we can invest and make sure that it thrives again, especially for the next generation. So that's why the women are involved in the war. They are involved because they want peace. They want to see the war end. It is not a war that they invited onto themselves, but everybody is hurting. You know, some of us who are out here, we are not at home because we too, you know, we are victims of the war. You know, you ask me, I retire. Why shouldn't I go home and enjoy myself? But I don't have a place to go home to. My home has been burned down and looted and everything taken away from me. So I have to live abroad. I have to come and seek asylum here. So everybody is affected by in one way or another by this war. And it is really so unnecessary. Really, you cannot demonstrate peacefully and find that the guns, you know, gunships are, are focused on you. You know, that is not what we want. We want a country where people can demonstrate where the expression of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly is respected for everybody. We don't have these freedoms in the country that we call home right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I, I, was, I, was, I was so interested by what you were saying, yeah, Maggie, because, uh, and it was making me to think about this work, uh, which is about the Liberian uh, diaspora around the conflict there, and this formula that they use, we are also suffering here. That is the burden of, uh, of, of carrying uh, the community, which uh, is somehow let alone uh, with all the basic needs uh, is on basically uh, and, and most uh, largely on the, on the diaspora. So thank you very much. I also understand that there's also an historical imagination and a representation about how you articulate the here, where you are, where you are living, maybe comfortably, and, and, and the here, I mean, here in Cameroon, where you know that uh, your, your family, your loved ones might be confronted to you and, and that. So thank you very much for your, for your testimony. I will now turn to Rosaline, Rosaline Oba. Uh, I would like to, to hear, uh, first of all, you as a journalist uh, who have been uh, somehow covering uh, this, this conflict, I want to know uh, how, how, how you've been able to carry on your work. And I know that it has not been, a, it, it, it has not been easy. Uh, so how difficult it is to report on, on this conflict and especially in an intersectional uh, dimension, what does it mean for the woman that you are to continue to, 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 to work, to do your, your trade in such circumstances? Can you, can you tell us a bit uh, about how, how you, you've been able to, to, to work and, and, and give account of what was happening? Thank you very Rosalie. much. Thank, thank you very you much. Here. You're welcome. Thank you. I want to say that, first of all, uh, practicing in a seemingly war-torn environment like the Northwest, especially where I am based, is a huge challenge, especially when you stand and the community is expecting you with the right information to make informed decisions. Sometimes it is also difficult for you to detach your feelings and emotions, and definitely you are getting like you're tempted to be sensational in your reporting as a female journalist, as many of us face 
that double and triple effect of the crisis, especially coping with being based in that region, and of course, faced with a myriad of challenges ranging from extortion, ranging from harassment from all sorts, especially sexual harassment. You also have arrests. We also go through uh, uh, kidnaps, threats, and sometimes we have difficulty to access new sources because there are so many people who are afraid to speak. We also have movement restrictions, especially in, 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 in the Northwest, where some areas are definitely unaccessible. For example, some sections like to go to Kumbu and Kambe were like nightmares for months. And this was not easy for us to go on the ground to get information. And so this has given rise to some kind of mixed feelings. And I must say that uh, one of the most difficult parts was the aspect of actually uh, getting to deal with the name calling. Sometimes you go to the field, you interview a uh, uh, military, you interview uh, non-state armed groups. Once you interview the military, the military looks at it as, as in you are taking information like a spy to go give to, to, to the non state or to the separatists. So let me call it that way. And uh, otherwise, um, or let me say, on the other hand, you get to um, the separatists you also want to do some kind of fact finding and you are having the same challenge as your terms a black leg and sometimes even the government officials uh, look at some of us uh, female journalists and even journalists as a whole as amber journalists as terrorists how do you come face to face with such challenges i i must recount that sometimes uh, when this crisis just started some of our colleagues, for example, like Pet Nyashe, who were the first to go into the bushes, uh, uh, came through open fire and had to uh, uh, go through some kind of hostage for two hours, uh, trying to hide away from any stray bullet uh, towards her direction. We can have the likes of Telambu of Equinox TV. You can imagine that, for example, those of us who come from the community media, we go into the nooks and crannies to get information. For example, you have the vulnerable group, women, children, persons with disabilities. A case in point is that of recent where one of us went to Mbengui to interview persons with disabilities who were suffering from sexual harassment, rape issues, and uh, a security official uh, uh, looks at that journalist um, actually getting the interviews and creates a false alarm to say that the journalist is harassing, that female journalist is harassing uh, the person with disability. And you can imagine, the journalist was now held hostage for two hours, her, her images seized and deleted. And then of course, she was asked to, to, to pay for her bail upon which she would not be able to leave the place. And if she were not, actually ready to defend herself, imagine where she would be. We will be looking for her from one uh, security station to another. From my personal experience, I kind, I, I kind enough uh, want to imagine a scenario where in 2019, I usually train journalists, I train youths in peace building, and you can imagine that that is our own contribution that we do in order to make sure that everyone is part and parcel of the peace building process. 2019, you can imagine that I was training and didn't even know that my picture was on the internet, wanted, written there, wanted, dead or alive. You can imagine, and what was I doing? I was doing a training on peace building. And I was so happy that the persons who where the organizer did not inform me while I was doing the presentation. It was only afterwards, I saw people moving up and down, I, I couldn't understand. And so when I came out for my presentation, I was told that our pictures are all over the internet, uh, written there, wanted. And when I went through the comments, some people were saying that we were sponsored by the government to talk peace. And secondly, that we should be roasted alive when we are discovered, as if that was enough 
at my place of work, they called me and told me that at a certain date and time, they will come and arrest me. And can you imagine, they came on that day and time. Fortunately, I was in Yaoundé for another peace training. And when I came back, they, 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 they did a call to, to me and told me that my name is all over all the camps in Bamenda. And let me know that I, the moment I am discovered, they will just tear me and finish me into pieces. Now, this is just one of the many uh, cases that female journalists are going through. You turn to the government. You want to go to uh, maybe the suburbs. The military sees you in difficult areas. And the military tells you, if you can reach this uh, place, it means that you have a deal with those boys. So it means that we, we, we are already looked upon as people who cannot be able to brave the odds and do it ourselves. But I think there are so many of us who are getting out there to risk our lives in, in, in search for the right information for the, the, the population. And for us at the community media, we are definitely, as female journalists, always striving to make sure that we give a voice to the voiceless. We ensure that we try to make sure that those who are bearing the bronze, the women, persons with disabilities, are given a voice. But then what do we get in return? Sometimes we go to the field with no protective gadgets. There is open fire. You just have to survive by your own means. How do we cope when we see this? You go to officials, the government, you want to get information for the community. You are asked, you are, you are, you are, you are give, they are given like sexual advances as condition for you to get that particular information. So all of this is a pointer that uh, female journalists are going through a lot. Come back to the newsroom, what is happening? They want to think of sending uh, a journalist to the field, they are thinking about the men, they don't think about the female journalists. They are still looking at those stereotype ideas that think that women or female, um, females places, are, 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 or, or females are definitely weak, the weaker sex. So we are getting out of our comfort zones because we think that we have the mandate to definitely uh, give a voice to those who are out there who are suffering, the women who are suffering, who are bearing the bronze. There are times that some of us have gone to places and our equipment have been seized. There are times that we have gone to places and there is no way out, we are stuck. Think of the female journalists who are even working in radio stations, in media houses where they shut down the radio station at 9 p.m. Some of them have testified, carry, uh, there are so many of us that have been caught in between the, 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 the two actors, sexual harassment, sometimes they even go to robbing us. So what, do, what, what can we make of such a situation? When you're out there struggling to see how you can be able to dish out the right information to the population. And one of the things we are striving to do in terms of um, making sure that we stand our grounds is to make sure that we refuse and reject in every form that we are not capable of handling whatever is on the ground. We have a duty, and that is why we've been able to make sure that our reports are bottom-top approach. We try to tell the stories Today, many female journalists are now good storytellers. They try to recount the stories of the, of the victims of the crisis. And through this, so many humanitarian actors have penetrated some of these zones that were not penet penetrable. And another aspect is that women have been able to, female journalists have been able to go to an extra mile to uh, produce uh, uh, conflict-sensitive programs that go a long way to change and shift the mindset uh, of the population towards valuing non-violent responses to conflicts. We have brought them to our platforms. We have tried to speak to both parties today. So many female journalists have carved their niche in peace journalism, in conflict transformation, 
in fact checking and also in this in fighting against things like hate speech misinformation disinformation and fake news we are also moving out of our newsrooms and going to the public doing serious sensitization of the population because we think that it is not only the duty of the states or the non-state armed groups, it is the duty of everybody to be part and parcel of the peace building process. And so in spite of the challenges, we are still holding on to hope. We are not giving up. We have had our own ups and downs. We've been kidnapped for ransoms. We've been harassed, we've been arrested, but we still think that there is that duty that we owe to the community. And that is that of informing them, giving them the right information to make decisions that will be appropriate to prevent them from any further harm. So I will end here for now uh, and we'll definitely come back to, to, to more discussion. Thank you so much, Rosaline. This is this is so, you know, I've been at the communication council and I am I am so uh, well I'm I'm, I'm, I'm your, your, your experience is so interesting and it shows us clearly uh, I'm saying this because by then we had this discussion on, on how uh, how do you cover conflict and with all oh, the, the fact that journalists have been under a, an, a, a tremendous tre pressure uh, and we did the, 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 you, you mentioned that you had the, the challenge of your being safe of continuing to do your job uh, and, and being safe and we all know some of your colleagues who were arrested I was thinking right away about me uh, Mifo but not only there, there are some of your colleagues, some, some, some died. And, uh, and, and what, I, what I also see is how you've been able to, to tackle the, the fact that uh, the, 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 the conflict is even underreported about, which is also a challenge. I, I was having a discussion with a colleague on the fact that the Cameroonian uh, conflict, this, this uh, Anglophone crisis is one of the, 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 the under, uh, undercovered, undercovered. So, uh, and of course, if it is uh, underreported about because of security, then uh, I see how you've been able to also work to have not only secondhand information, but but force forces, and then you've worked into uh, advocating for peace. So it's not just about reporting, but also uh, standing up. For, uh, for, for peace and against hate peace. Th thank you very much. I want to just signal to those who are uh, our viewers and all those who are, uh, are following us that you can, you can already uh, send us uh, your questions or your comments, all your views in the Q&A box. So we are going to be able to address them. So it will be very, very happy to hear about your own, uh, your own thoughts about this, uh, well, this, this conversation. Thank you. I want to come now to how do we how how the, the, the peacemaking uh, uh, initiatives and, and efforts and uh, I I know that uh, from what you've told me, uh, Rosalie yeah, Maggie, uh, you've been all uh, uh, you've been all uh, involved, Sarah, involved in, in in standing up and working to 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 have peace come back. So I want to hear you more about. What do you think is the best way? Yeah, Maggie. What is the best way? Even you as being involved in, in, in your international and international development career, what do you think that uh, what, what, what can be the best way for ensuring the multiple abuses uh, that women are suffering from all sides? Uh, how do we address them? What, 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 is, what can be done? And how can this be taken into consideration? within uh, a peace uh, processes. So wh where do we start and, and how do we really, uh, how do we, we, we take these, these very key challenges? Maggie. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nadine, for that uh, question. Um, first of all, uh, let me say that I also represent the women's groups of Global Takenberg. And Global Takenberg is actually a group made up it's an umbrella of groups women's groups individuals who work for the peace and women need peace to be able to thrive when there is a war 
remember our countries in on the African continent are trying to grow at a very fast rate. When there is war, it takes your country back. And southern Cameroons, where it is located within that triangle called the Republic of Cameroon, this war has taken us 75 years back economically. And this is a country that produces 40% of Cameroon's entire wealth. The oil that comes from the Indian area gives the government three million dollars every single day and that is the resource that the government is using to buy weapons to shoot and kill citizens so what do you do to bring peace in this kind of a situation you have said the war is very much underreported because we are sitting underneath a sovereign country we are not free to go out and do the things that we're doing to bring about peace we don't have the sovereignty that we can approach other countries and, uh, and and get assistance like ukraine you saw how quickly you know the west all came to support ukraine against the incursion of russia that could have been us but we don't have that sovereignty so the women of global tax women have to do their best that they can in diplomacy we do talk to other uh, uh stakeholders we do talk to organizations. I recall even um, Ari himself had interviewed me for, for this report back in the summer of 2020. So yes, we try our best to come together to see what we can do. And we have four pillars that we work with. So there is the humanitarian, which is the biggest pillar because we see the pain caused by our own government on our people on a daily basis. You know, the, our thriving towns, the women's livelihoods have been taken away from them. Their houses are burned. We have 500 plus communities burned to the ground. When the women farm, that's where they put the food. So our own government is not just shooting at us, but trying to starve us, you know. So we go to here where we are in the diaspora. We go to our senators. We go to our representatives and we plead for them and the one thing you've seen the resolution 684 from the american congress come out to say this war must stop and the sanctions could be placed on government officials and on people who continue to fight the war so those are the kinds of things that we do as global tackling and as women and mothers and grandmothers whose children cannot have an education now for five years our children are unable to go to school. So we appeal to all the um, organizations that can assist. You know, we put money together. We have uh, women who are working, especially with IDPs and refugees, but mostly in Nigeria with the refugees there. These are women who are members of Global Tackenberg, and they are working uh, to make sure that uh, we can, yes, we can have school start again because as you know from Cameroon, the Anglophone is the, per the person who wants their child to go to school, who will do anything, sell land, do whatever, to make sure that their child has a good education. And what we were demonstrating about was the fact that our children were receiving substandard education. So how do we make things happen? Right now, we write to other groups that can help. We've written to the UN, we've written to, you know, all over. And right now, if you see this uh, T-shirt that I have, it says release them. So we are, we are also working for the release of our prisoners who are professionals in themselves, people. You know, we have like 3,500 uh, detainees from the war in Kondengi and in other places of torture. So we write to, you know, uh, all over with the diplomatic work that we are doing to request a free uh, unfettered fact-finding mission for the UN to go into the country and look at the situation for themselves. Because what happens, we see on TV, when any visitor, dignitary visits the country, they just stay in Yaoundé and they are given gifts and they leave, and that is the end of our problem. But we are saying we need for the UN to mandate a fact-finding mission to go into the areas to see for themselves what the harm the war is causing on us 
we organize training sessions at uh, um, political education sessions. Uh, we have something called the Southern Cameroons International Town Hall, which we have every other week. And in that, we've invited all kinds of people. We work with the women. Uh, you mentioned Liberia just now. We work with the women in Liberia to find out how did they do to get, what exactly did they do to get the peace process going, to make sure that peace returned to Liberia. Because the longer the war lasts, the worse it is to actually make amends and reconstruct and fix things. So we need for an urgent end to the war. We want these detainees of the conflict freed because they are parents, they are business people, they are uh, professionals. These are the people who would keep our economy going and they are locked up in jail, being tortured for no reason whatsoever. Because like I said before, freedom of speech, freedom of association are rights that as an Anglophone, we take pride in. I'm able to express my mind to tell you how I feel. That is why in our relationship with Francophone Cameroon, the Anglophone keeps getting uh, assaulted all the time because once we see that things are not going right, we will march, we will talk about it, we will assemble, and that is how the guns keep coming at us. So now our cry is basically, let's negotiate. If you take me back to La Republique, it's like you're taking me, a raped woman, back to the rapist to say, sit in this relationship. The relationship is not working. We want our own country to live with our own values and to live the lives that we want for our people and our children especially. We cannot no longer tolerate that you are a citizen, you are a private citizen, you want to express yourself, there is a gun pointed at you. You want to assemble normally, there is a gun pointed at you. When will this end? That is what the women are crying. When will it end? It will not end because we keep getting raped, we keep getting uh, 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 beaten, we keep getting punished for being citizens. This should never have gotten to this stage. By the time they are talking about the federated states, that is too much for us. It's, we are gone, I'm sorry to say. So we do all of the things that we do because we want peace to come so our country and our people can thrive again. We are doing our utmost as the women of Global Carpenter to make sure that you know the war ends. So we are talking to, to um, everybody, everybody, the leaders of the, 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 the self-defense forces, we talk to them, you know, we tell them sometimes, you are not supposed to go near schools, near hospitals, okay, or near churches. And yet we see all the time, you know, uh, the military or whoever, there's shooting in church. There's shooting in schools, there's shooting in hospitals, things that we don't want to see. And we write, yes, we do write about those things and we do open letters. But also, uh, I mean, I could tell you more, but I see that. Oh, you yeah, know, no, I know. I, yes, I, yes. I, 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 yeah, I, Maggie, I, I, I think we have, to still, we have to still discuss this. But as you know, we are going to, we need some time for the, for the Q&A session. And actually, we've uh, run out of the, the time that was given to us. Uh, thank you very much. I've, I've noted that the Global Tatum Bank are doing uh, diplomatic uh, pressure, uh, also uh, calling on the, the, the prisoner release and, and calling for a fact-finding uh, mission to be able to, 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 to assess clearly what is, what is going on. Please, I want uh, now, uh, please, Rosaline. Rosaline, I, I want to, to know uh, how you, um, uh, you see uh, women activism uh, in, this, in this conflict. Uh, you, you told us about how personally you were involved. But we want to hear more about the contribution that uh, women activists uh, could, could, could have, not only in this conflict, but more largely, uh, well, I say more broadly, how can they contribute in solving uh, this, uh, this, this conflict? And how does the issue of gender inequality can also be something that hinders the, the effort? So I, I, can, can, I, can I know more about uh, well, what, what, you, what you think, not only at the, the level of the conflict, but more generally in the Cameroonian society where we know that this gender inequality uh, are so, uh, so, so present and, and we know that societies where uh, actually 
uh, there is no or, or the gender equality is is, is not attained a uh, society that are more likely to, to be exposed to conflict so please Rosaline, tell me okay thank you uh, Nadine I think um, sometimes when you talk um, we need to always get some kind of evidence on the ground and definitely go general and I start from the Northwest and Southwest women activists uh, to mention that they have been doing a whole lot and still to do a whole lot if they put some few things together. And I must say that uh, on a general note, uh, when there is any conflict, I usually always see women as first responders. Um, Sarah just talked about the lamentation campaign and the idea um, brought forth by Feka Pashibel at the time may have so rest in peace of snot. And then me, women who have also um, participated in, uh, uh, in conflict uh, situations as caregivers. They have shared food. They have acted as humanitarian supporters. They have also been uh, uh, acting as caregivers when actors in conflict or victims in conflict are wounded in a way. And sometimes, even in this conflict, if I take the case of the Northwest and Southwest, you see women already bearing, uh, acting as uh, uh, bearing children. And then they are also acting as negotiators on a, on a local, national, and international level. And they have that loud voice, loud voice in calling out the wrongs of warring parties for an amicable settlement and an end to this crisis. I can remember efforts done by SNOT, and I must pay tribute to Chada of uh, Agobala, and through Muriel, this came into the limelight. They have done online campaigns, statements, protests, and I must appreciate these personalities. And then, of course, you cannot be able to uh, sideline organizations um, where uh, women are taking the, the, the centra central stage, like the Cameroon Women's Peace Movement, Kawopem, who are the initiators of the National Women's Peace Convention, the first ever National Peace Convention that has taken place in Cameroon. And that brought together over 1,500 women from all 10 regions in Cameroon. An initiative, which of course should be applauded, bringing not only Anglophone women together, but both Anglophone and Francophone women, and even women who never knew anything about this crisis. And today, are now seeing reasons to actually network and also contribute their own quarter to see towards the, the end uh, to this crisis. We have also seen women take part in street protests, like uh, the lady in Moyoka who was killed. They have also had candlelight vigils in six regions in memory of those who have lost their lives as a result of this conflict. And women have this nature of building a culture of peace, especially in these three affected regions in Cameroon. Northwest, Southwest, far north, in the east, even. And they have also been able to implement the first ever general peace building fund for the Northwest and Southwest regions of Cameroon, of which a national network to end gender based violence has been created. What an applaudable initiative. Of course, women have also put hands together, women activists, for the assessment of the first ever national action plan for the UN. Uh, 1325 uh, resolution. Of course, I can go on and on to mention organizations, women-led organization activists like Women Peace Builders Network, um, individuals like Edith Kawala. They are prominent names. Uh, of course, media ladies, you already mentioned Mimi Menfo. There are so many that have been able to put on uh, a, a, a common front. And what should be the positive that I draw from uh, women activism? The first thing is that they have a common goal always. That is to bring peace to any uh, conflict situation like the one we are facing. And of course, when women engage in a peace building initiative, they are dedicated to its cause. The first, another issue is that they have that ability to negotiate and mediate. And of course, we know our women, in spite of all what they are going through, they are resilient. Now, there are so many things that are happening that could definitely lead us to the end of this crisis if we rally our forces together. But there are some challenges that I see within the women activism circle 
which of course, if we don't bring them out, I think is not going to help women activism in terms of this crisis. The problem between women's groups or network has never been the inclusion of Francophone women, but that of power and non-recognition of the efforts of real actors. And if we want to talk women's role in the Northwest and Southwest, there are definitely faces we should see. We should start thinking about women who are making efforts in the suburbs, where some of us, the urban ladies, cannot be able to access. Women like uh, Bibiana Digambong of Bihaf facing the guns and building peace in womb, these are the real actors. Division and partners cause due to the lack of recognition of other actors. We should definitely sit up as women activists. Also, the non-recognition of the efforts of other women and women organizations working tirelessly to end this crisis. The crisis group reports, I'm glad that um, Mr. Array brought it up. I must applaud the report and acknowledge the contribution of one group. Uh, the report definitely acknowledged the contribution of one group, but forgetting to acknowledge the contribution of other groups like Kawopem. And I, and I think this is something that definitely brings some kind of friction, which I think as a media woman, I should be kind enough to be straight out with it. And this gives room for decision and no recognition of experts, which is a great problem we have been raising for years. Another issue is tribalism. The women's space have, these women's spaces have been greatly infiltrated by tribalistic tendencies. Women use lines to exclude and chastise other women from accessing opportunities. And the diversion of more prominent women into gaining proceeds from the crisis, both financial and political, has ramshackled the women's peace building process. Aspects of funders, partners, and picking women based on personal relationships are not on, are not on competence for most opportunities, neglecting experts, which brings equally tension. And I will lastly end with this, uh, which is an issue, a known rec recognition of certified, uh, certified experts in some fields as every woman is, an, is a gender expert, a peace builder and other titles. And so if we want to recognize the role of women in the crisis in the Northwest and Southwest, we must prioritize the voices of the real actors and ensure that the efforts of every woman risking their lives to build peace is recognized and acknowledged. I would have been happier to have on this panel as well, the general coordinator or a member of the Cameroon Women's Peace Movement so that they can also mention their own efforts and contributions we should also not go on notice. Well, I know this is like yeah, a series. Definitely, you can come back to me. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Rosaline. I know that well. It's always very well. It's not. It's very challenging to. But I, I, I'm happy that you are here. Somehow, these voices are are brought in the conversation by you. So thank you very much. You notice um, that uh, in the report, there's there's an effort to really diversify. The, the voices uh, and you've, you've, you've made well to mention all these top-down, bottom-up uh, perspective to really bring in uh, much, much more uh, women. I, I want to just turn now to, to Sarah, uh, Sarah Lifanda, who uh, I, I said I was going to come back to you, Sarah, and I, I would like to hear more about uh, all these, these voices, uh, Rosaline was saying that there are some voices that are not in this conversation that maybe they, they shouldn't have been here though. As you know, Rosaline, we can't, we don't have space for, but uh, Sarah, how do you view the variety of, uh, of women's voices and their opinion in this crisis? And, and how do, do, do they enhance the argument they, they, in favor of, of women contribution into finding uh, long-lasting uh, solution to the crisis, Sarah? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I would want to say that women play an integral part, such as mediation and negotiation. Yes, from the reports of the crisis group, 
I noticed, actually to me, I understood that the crisis group made mention of SNOT and the birth of other women-led organization, which from my understanding, it's like it, they all uh, came out from SNOT, which uh, I don't see any worry in that. And uh, the truth is something must start, must begin somewhere. And then it, 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 it builds and it grows. But SNOT alone can never bring peace. This, the women within SNOT can never bring peace if it's just within the 150 women in SNOT. But we need a diverse group. We need as many more women to come on board so that the, the, the more we are, the louder our voices. Now, it might be um, a kind of uh, maybe not every, not every voice can be can be written down not every some of them might or will be left outside not because they are not important or not because their roles are not uh, uh, are not uh, recognized it's just that i believe in writing you always write they always have series and other opportunities to talk to other pe persons and bring in their own contributions yes normally uh, I would say Kaupem is a sister to Snot because we all work for the same objective, which is bringing peace within our country, our region. I would even say, I'll, I'll always I say that I don't want to look at our political differences, our ideologies, political differences, but I want to look at one thing that binds us, that we are women. And as women, we have the power. All we need is the space. I always tell myself and others that the state at which the crisis is, we should stop the blame game. Because if we keep blaming, then we will never get to a solution because the blaming will continue. I say that we should stop blaming our shadows for the shape of our body. Because we are, we are just the same, we are one. And as women, we should keep aside what the men are doing. Because if you look at this crisis, it is more about ego, uh, I must be right, it is me, it is, uh, I need to protect the sovereignty. Everybody wants to protect something. Everybody is fighting for something. Forgetting that there, there's a huge space where you have the voiceless and the voiceless are the majority and they are the ones actually suffering, especially the women and young girls. They are the ones bearing the brunt, but yet they are still the ones pushing to have a, a, a sustainable solution for a crisis that they actually know nothing about. So and the way I, I look at this is that we should forget about the, our, our personal gains because from what Rose said, the issue of leadership, that is what is bringing down women. Because everybody wants to be in front. Everybody, everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants to be recognized. And it doesn't work that way. There are some people that do the work behind the scene and others, others uh, take the train ahead. But it is all left for the leader to acknowledge the fact that while we have this success, it is because I have this group of wonderful women that have brought in their expertise together and we are at this level. So we need to actually, as women, for us to have a sustainable peace and work together in real harmony, we need to keep 
away aside the issue of me, myself, and I. And also, the, I always say the PhD, the poor heart down syndrome. And the truth is that men have taken this and they use it against the women. But for a few times that we, during the, the Cameroon uh, Women Peace Convention, which I was uh, opportune to lead the task force of mobilization and sensitization, I understood that if we keep our differences, we can do wonderful things. We can move mountains. And sometimes we can even separate the sea because we had come together, we walked, and I have this belief that women can work well with women. If only we keep our differences aside, if only we keep our personal gains and look at the bigger picture, those that we tend to represent, because it is not me as Sarah Deval, but I am like a moral person representing the grassroots, those that their voices, those that are in the suburb, as Rose uh, says. So, so we, I, I don't need to put myself, but I need to take into consideration the people that we represent. It should be their, 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 their interests, not us. But you know, Sarah, I think it's also something we need to, uh, to accept. We need to, to accept the fact that there is a, a competition it's a competition, which is also a, a, a donors-based competition around who is going to get resources to, to, to be able. I think it's something that we need to, 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 to accept as, no, no, I would say not normalcy, but uh, if, if, if there's Kamchak uh, Gisaye Keng in the QA session, who is, who is uh, calling our attention and saying, I strongly think that networking among the women group will go a long way to help in peace building, but it is, uh, so, but is the, the, the international crisis group doing anything to bring these ladies together? So there, there are some questions that are for, uh, for the, the, the crisis group, but as you were saying, Sarah, yes, yes. But there's a level of competition which is necessarily unavoidable. Why? Because uh, there, there is a challenge of getting the resources to be, to, to have the, the activities. So the issue is where do we, uh, how, how do all these women, all these groups, find a ground where they can at least work together. So uh, I, I'm saying this, and then I want to maybe uh, all to you all, uh, my dear sisters, uh, well, you have these, uh, these questions that uh, was, uh, uh, that was, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in a QA session and I, I was wondering if there's this question about what are the recommendations that Maggie has already, yeah, Maggie has already even uh, uh, wrote down an answer, but what are, what are the suggestions and recommendations that uh, you want to make uh, to the international donors uh, who are seeking to support your efforts, who are seeking to support women's peaceful activism in Cameroon? I'll come back to you again, Rosaline, and then maybe Sarah, and then there's another, uh, a preoccupation, and I see that some of them are not challenged. And I, I see here that it's this comparis comparison between other conflicts and especially other groups in, in conflict uh, zone, the, and then the, the Cameroonian situation. And I see that we, we, we some of these uh, challenges are not to be to be addressed. So I, I just please anybody feel free. How, please. So maybe yeah, Maggie, you you might maybe want to tell us what you wrote in the in the, in the chat. Okay. Um, basically, uh, the questions that I I was trying to answer was about recommendations that I would make to the international donors to, who are seeking to support peace activism in Cameroon. Well, so I I basically said that the international community can openly sponsor the peace process. They can do that, they can come together. And we've been lobbying here for them to do just that. And we saw recently with the Coalition for Dialogue and Negotiations, at, at their meeting in Toronto, we saw the four 
countries that came together to support us in that process. Since they returned to Cameroon, they've been joined by Switzerland and uh, South Africa. So to make their voices louder, they should not just remain in Cameroon, but bring that voice into the international space, bring it to the UN, bring it to the EU uh, uh, Parliament. So bring, take it to the AU, even though everybody, every one of us is disappointed in the AU, they are not paying attention to us. But if they can bring their voices to that space that is an open space and have the countries vote on the issue, like they've done on Ukraine, you saw how quickly they voted on Ukraine in the, in the UN. And, and, and that we can see that uh, Russia is isolated now uh, because the Ukrainians are able to uh, uh, defend themselves. If that kind of a situation is applied to Cameroon, then we would see uh, a difference. But the women really do need support from the international community in order to take care of those refugees and IDPs that are so, so carrying the burden of this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, Maggie. Uh, uh, all of all of what you've said, uh, my dear sisters, was, was so pers was, was so so interesting that I did I could not even even do my 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 job of 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 timekeeper, and we 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 have run <laughs> completely out of time. I want to to call the Ray maybe to say a word on this issue of recommendations, uh, please. Though. I know that we are supposed to, to, to stop now, but please, can you, can you uh, maybe uh, say, say a word? Uh, if I can just say a very quick yeah, one. Please. A, very, a very quick one. Uh, it's, uh, the solution to this uh, conflict lies in dialogue, inclusive dialogue. And we've made the point very clear, and you've heard from some of these women that women are involved uh, when the time for a peace process, an inclusive peace process comes, it will be a very big mistake to leave out the women. Uh, there needs to be a formula for women to be involved uh, there in the peace talks. Uh, and for now, for immediate relief, women need support in terms of uh, providing them health, health to victims of sexual violence, also judicial support, uh, but also uh, both the government and uh, the opponents on the other side, the separatists, should allow space for the women to campaign for a return to peace because their perspectives are important and they are helping to shape and to bring some a bit of humanity in this conflict that's rocking the Anglophone regions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I would have loved to, to still come back to Rosaline, to come back to Sarah, but I think I've, I've, we have eaten six minutes. We're out of, out of time. It was just wonderful having you all. Um, I, just, I just hope that we still have some time. I, I really hope that the uh, organizers of this, uh, this panel would, 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 would connect us so that we can keep this conversation here at the university. I would be so, so happy to, to, to hear you here, to, to bring you in here. So that all this we can also discuss in this uh, kind of uh, platform. So thank you, thank you for for being there. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for sharing your views with us, your experience, and congratulations for standing. Congratulations for 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 doing what you are doing. Thank you, Elvis, for also inviting me here. You know, I'm just humbled by by what I hear you are doing out there. Uh, so that we can have peace uh, come back. And I was so impressed by the courage and the, the leadership that you are all uh, showing. So I just want to say that this uh, conversation is still, it was recorded and it's available. So if you, you want to still watch it, you want to, to still come back to it, you can on the, on the website, on the YouTube channel of the International Crisis Group. So uh, please let us, let us hear uh, about what, how you are doing, what you are doing. I'll be very happy. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Elvis. Thank you, Rosaline. Thank you, thank you Yeah, Maggie. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you to you thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you.